decided we better start since we have a full program for today. Uh, first and foremost, of course, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to our annual update uh, in transplantation in the beautiful Napa Valley. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time from your busy clinical schedules to be here with us. Um, one of the most important ingredient in the success of our uh, transplant center is the fact that we have this very close collaboration with our referring nephrologist. Uh, and your presence here demonstrates that. And I think ultimately it does impact beneficially uh, the long-term outcome of our patients and how we manage them. Uh, just as a reminder, this is a CME uh, program and therefore after the meeting, you can uh, go in the website that uh, you have listed on the package that you got and you can uh, <laughs> not only get the CME, but give us some suggestions for topics that you think are of importance for, uh, for you to hear for next year. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our partners uh, in biotech and pharma, without whose support it would be very difficult to mount such a, an ambitious project as this uh, annual program. And uh, without much delay, I'd like to introduce our uh, current Chief of uh, Transplantation, Chris Fries, to give you a report on the state of transplantation and outcomes of transplantation at UCSF. Well, thank you, uh, Flavio, and again, welcome uh, to everybody. Again, it is great to uh, be at this meeting again and, and uh, uh, interact with uh, many of you. And I can say it's a real highlight for me to be able to stand up here and talk about our program and publicly and acknowledge uh, all of uh, the people that help us uh, produce our great results and, and take care of your patients. So uh, again, I would like to echo uh, Flavio's um, uh, praise to our pharma and industry support. Um, please try and stop by their uh, displays out front and you'll also see a um, table for the National Kidney Foundation. We're um, uh, going to be putting together a team to walk uh, at the annual fundraiser in June and certainly we'd love to have any of our staff or others sign up to join in the walk and if anyone wants to make a donation that would be uh, uh, equally as um, uh, uh, good, um, so check that out, out out in the lobby. I'd also like to thank Flavio for inviting me to, to speak again. He mentioned uh, that I am the uh, chief. It, he forgot to say interim. I'm still the interim chief. Um, but uh, thank you again, and uh, thank you especially to both himself and uh, Peggy Millar for putting this together. I, I help out with the arrangements for a, a similar liver meeting in the fall, and I know how much work this is, and, and they always put on a great show, so thank you. So I wanted to run through uh, the usual beginning part of this talk, which again is to acknowledge uh, the people that make this program uh, what it really is, and uh, make sure you guys hear some names that uh, of people that take care of the different aspects. We've sort of arranged the kidney program to really have some dedicated personnel for different phases of care from the evaluation phase all the way through the post-transplant phase. And then also have uh, broken out some of our staff to focus on the living donor uh, transplants and then others on the deceased donor side. So without further ado, the um, evaluation phase, of course, is a very important part where we get referrals and have to build the patient's charts, figure out if they're really appropriate candidates to be evaluated, and Stephanie Pingle and Prince uh, Tenoso help with that aspect. Uh, we also have uh, coordinators uh, in our outreach sites that help uh, with um, uh, uh, intake from different areas around Northern uh, California, as well as the Fresno area and Hawaii, and uh, their names are shown there. So a very important part of our program because this is what really gets the patient started on the long trail to hopefully eventually get a transplant. Now we have the two different teams that'll uh, participate in, in getting recipients ready. Uh, the living donor team, of course, not only has to work with the recipients, but also the donors. 
and you can see there's a, a, a number of people there in that uh, uh, area. And then the deceased donor team uh, helps to uh, get the patients ready by ordering the different tests when the patients are ready to come off the wait list. And you know, we, we are, we're always talking about living donor and obviously living donor is very, very important uh, to our program and it's certainly the best way to get our patients transplanted and I think we've had great successes. But really the majority of our patients do receive kidneys via deceased donors. So I just wanna sh throw a little shout out to our deceased donor team who sometimes don't get as much uh, accolade as our living donor team, but you guys do, are doing a fantastic job and I know it's a, it's a tough job. Uh, and then we have a post-transplant uh, coordinator as well, Flora. Um, we also have some nurse practitioners and PAs that can function at a little bit higher level in terms of taking care of patients in the, in the post-operative phase. And our post-adult uh, ki kidney um, NPs are shown there. We have two dedicated uh, uh, NPs that really work both on the pre and post side in pediatrics. And then very importantly in, in our inpatient team to take care of the large number of patients that come through the hospital, we have a very robust team of, of nurse practitioners um, that, that in this day and age we couldn't survive without. Um, you know, when I did my residency, we, we had residents to do all this work, but with work hour restrictions, there's no way we could get by without the excellent care that our, our inpatient NPs and PAs provide. We have a dedicated coordinator for uh, pancreas, Julia Warner, uh, and then uh, a living donor coordinator who's responsible for helping uh, get the donors through the workup phase and initial evaluation, then also uh, plays a very vital role in their post-operative care, and that's uh, Anna Marie Torres. So managing all these people is a huge job as well. That's something I've definitely learned over the last year and a half of of being interim, so we have some great managers that help with that. Carrie Bach is our newest hire, um, uh, been with us now for about uh, five months, six months. Uh, Jennifer Kearney, uh, assistant director, and then Carolyn Light, who's the director. Um, the other aspects of taking care of these patients are covered by our social workers, and we have a whole uh, group of social workers that uh, are working with our program. Uh, and Sandy Weinberg is one of the important people that is uh, designated as our independent living donor advocate. So any potential uh, living donor uh, is assigned to her to help uh, be guided through the process. And then of course the complexities of finance and insurance uh, need to be handled as well with an army of financial counselors. And then the physicians, um, in the surgery side, we have a very stable crew. Um, there's been uh, really eight of us who have been uh, on the surgical uh, team for basically the last 18 years. We hired Dr. Garrett Roll three years ago. He's been our newest hire, and we're finally gonna hire a 10th surgeon, uh, Sharif Syed, who uh, is one of our finishing fellows, so you may hear his name. Uh, going forward. We're looking forward to him joining our group in, uh, in August. Um, on the adult nephrology side, a very stable group. Uh, Deb Aidy is the medical director. Uh, we have Sindhu Chandran, Xiang uh, Cheng Kung, uh, Brian Lee, Jun Shoji, Flavia, of course, and then Allison Weber make up our uh, team of nephrologists who from the surgical side, we are very indebted to, since they are really um, incredibly uh, important for the post-operative care and management, especially in the clinic. On the peds nephrology side, we have a robust group as well, shown there. Um, there haven't really been, I said important staff changes, in, but there hasn't really been any huge change in terms of uh, my position. As I mentioned, it's still interim uh, director uh, last year, I mentioned that uh, Dr. John Roberts was serving as uh, interim chair of surgery. Uh, we have now um, uh, been told that, well, we have a new uh, chair of surgery. It's not Dr. John Roberts, so he'll return to be a transplant surgeon in our group, and we're happy to have his, his focus back uh, on, on being a master surgeon. Um, we are uh, trying to expand uh, some of our outreach uh, personnel with extra social worker 
and nurse coordinator to help with evaluations in some of our outreach sites. So that's a huge uh, number of people. Again, it's a fantastic group. I'm really honored to, to, to work with you guys, and I, I think they do a fantastic job, and feel free to grab any one of them and chat with them uh, during the meeting. So what I'd like to do now is just go over some of our results and some of the current uh, programs we have in place. Um, so that large number of people are really necessary because this is the reality of the amount of work that we're uh, expected to try and cover each year, 2,500 uh, referrals uh, for this, um, this uh, calendar year. Not every one of those patients makes it in for a full evaluation, but uh, it, is, it is a large number of patients to have to work through. So I think we have a team that's ready to do that. We uh, do have the outreach locations, as I mentioned, including one in Hawaii, and uh, they, as I said, they are fully staffed to do evaluations, and a couple of locations uh, have um, post-operative care as well. And unfortunately, my newest slide didn't show up, but our wait list is actually under 5,000 now, um, as of about a year ago, uh, and our current list is, uh, is around 4,800. Uh, in a given year, we probably uh, have uh, nearly 1,000 patients removed from the list. Unfortunately, not all of those are because of transplants. Some are because they go to other centers. Way too many are because they pass away. And then, of course, some of them are transplanted. So our list has been relatively stable. If you look at the number of patients we put on the list, which is about 900 to 1,000 a year, and the number that come off, our list is sort of stuck at about 4,800 patients. And of course, this is the largest list in the country by almost double uh, the next closest program. So wait list management becomes a very important uh, part of our program when you look at this large volume of patients. Um, we do have certain criteria, both when patients come in for evaluation uh, as to who will be able to get on the list and then, of course, as patients wait year after year to get to the top of the list, if they meet these criteria indicating that they've um, deteriorated in some fashion, they'll have to be removed from the list. So the list is shown here. Basically, if they're oxygen dependent, uh, living in a skilled nursing facility, uh, poor functional status or frailty, uh, certainly an act of malignancy, uncorrectable coronary artery disease, uh, severe dementia or other unstable psychiatric uh, disorders and lack of some support are all reasons that um, uh, we think uh, would not uh, allow that patient to be a good candidate for kidney transplantation. So in terms of our work product, which is really kidney transplants, um, we are looking at another great year in uh, 2018, uh, probably about 350 to 370 transplants. Uh, what I'm particularly happy about is our living uh, donor transplants are back to the volumes that they were at in 2015 before we had the donor death at our program, which uh, slowed things down. So that's, again, through the very hard work of, of many members of our team. Um, we're still shooting for that elusive 400 transplants. I think we can do it. Um, we're certainly on, on a good um, uh, trajectory to get to that goal. And volume is one thing, but um, results in terms of graph survival and patient survival is even more important. And if you look at our latest SRTR results, the one-year survival of the patient if uh, they receive a living donor kidney is 99.3%. And from a deceased donor, it's 95.8%. So as expected um, with, uh, based on the severity of illness of our patients. Now, where are we going to find uh, other kidneys to do uh, the transplants to eventually hit 400? I think they're going to be in the areas of kidneys that uh, are, are harder to place and harder to utilize. Certainly the marginal kidney, the KDPI greater than 85 uh, kidney donor, uh, there's great potential to use more of those kidneys. Our volume in uh, 2017 was about 12 kidneys. I'd like to see, it, see that double, and we have some initiatives in, in place to make that happen. Uh, the use of hepatitis C positive kidneys is a, another important aspect of, 
a way to, to get more transplants, and you're going to hear a, a talk a little bit later about some new um, ideas in that regard. We have been able to use uh, five uh, donors from uh, donors that were HIV positive, which is now allowed under the HOPE Act, which uh, Dr. Peter Stock was instrumental in uh, getting through uh, the legislature. Um, that's been a, a great way for recipients who have HIV to get transplanted in a more expeditious fashion. And then, of course, you hear time and time again from us about PHS uh, guideline increased risk donors and the importance of having your patients think about those kidneys. We used 48 of those in uh, calendar year 17. Uh, donation after cardiac death donors is another important uh, group of uh, donors that, uh, in general, those kidneys function very well, although they do have a slightly higher DGF rate uh, right after transplant. And then pediatric on block kidneys is another area where we've uh, had a great interest in, in using those kidneys. So we, of course, want to pay attention to results when we start to push the envelope and use kidneys that aren't uh, quote-unquote optimal. And one way to look at that is uh, our DGF rates. And if you look in the upper left box, uh, the green uh, slice of pie is our DGF rate uh, at UCSF. And to the right of that is the DGF rate in our region, which includes California, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and uh, Nevada, and you can see we're within the range of what the delay graph function rate is in that area. It's a little bit higher than the national statistic, but again, it means we're able to do more transplants, and the great majority of these kidneys with delay graph function do go on to function well. We also can use length of stay data as a metric um, to uh, look at how well our patients are doing. And again, if you look in the left upper uh, box, the red line is the median uh, length of stay, which for our patients is about three days um, compared to the national average in the right lower box, which is around five days. So uh, again, the use of these kidneys that uh, may not be uh, optimal uh, has not resulted in a greater length of stay or really increased DGF rates uh, compared to the rest of the country. Now, the one area we don't do well, um, not by choice, but just by reality, is how quickly we get patients to transplant. And again, the line in the left upper uh, uh, box indicates nearly 2,000 days wait in, at our center for patients to, to get transplanted. And you can see that far exceeds uh, the national average or even the average throughout our region. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. We have a lot of highly sensitized patients, a lot of complex patients that require uh, sometimes uh, uh, a lot of extra testing or may have to be inactivated because of cardiac issues. So that's certainly one number I'd like to see improved. And really the only way to make that better is to think about uh, more of these marginal type kidneys. So in the longer waits, of course, translate into increased weightless mortality. And uh, as I mentioned, we list about 900 patients a year. Uh, about one in five uh, will receive a deceased donor transplant, and the rest will either die or become too sick to transplant. So that's a pretty alarming statistic when you think about uh, being the patient who's walking in the door for their first day uh, going on the list. And it's even worse for diabetics. Almost uh, only 10% of patients who are listed will actually make it to transplant. So besides using marginal donors, of course, living donor uh, transplantation is another avenue to get them transplanted quicker and certainly with a much higher quality kidney. So that's why focusing on living donation is such an important part of our program. Uh, the deceased donor numbers are really down in California as, a, as well as around the country. Um, uh, programs to help patients find uh, living donors are something that we've been very interested in. The Donor Champion Program, which I'm going to mention in a minute, is, is one such program to really try and educate recipients, donors, and other people in their social network about the value of considering living donation. And of course, um, the standard living donor transplant requires a healthy donor who's blood type compatible, cross-match compatible, you know, generally a, a similar size and hopefully a similar age to the recipient. 
however, finding those uh, perfect uh, match donors is very difficult, and that opens up the uh, use of the uh, exchanges, which we've been uh, um, a great um, uh, proponent of, and of course this works where a donor who may not be compatible with a given recipient gives their kidney to somebody else, and that can trigger a whole chain of transplants. We do have donors that come to our center who are what we call non-directed donors. They just want to donate their kidney to whoever we think it would best be utilized, and many times we advise them to think about going into these exchange programs and potentially triggering a series of transplants. So pair donation is a complex process. It requires a lot of education of uh, both the donors and the recipients who are considering going through this, and it requires a lot of uh, organization at the national level uh, using a consortium. We uh, participate in the National Kidney Registry, which I think is one of the better established consortiums for uh, getting this work done. Uh, we're also interested in trying to find matches within our own program. Given that we have 5,000 patients on the list, there's a reasonable chance we may be able to find matches within our own patients, which simplifies the logistics to some extent, so we're on the lookout for those types of cases. And uh, we, I just got this information last night that our center uh, was the busiest uh, uh, center in the National Kidney Registry in the last year we did. Uh, 43 transplants, and this is a real, uh, um, I think, uh, shout out to Valerie McBride, who's the coordinator that works on this, as well as the other members of the Living Donor Team. It's really a fantastic accomplishment to, to be number one in this arena, but also just the sheer number of transplants that are achieved with the matching program. So a way to expand that even further is to consider putting compatible pairs into the exchange, um, and this could be a non-identical but compatible pair, for instance, a blood group O giving to a recipient that's blood type A. Um, they may want to do this because they're a size mismatch or an age mismatch with their compatible uh, uh, but non-identical recipient. Um, it may also be because the recipient has some low-level DSAs and potentially we could get a better match kidney uh, by going into a, a, a exchange type arrangement. The real trick here, I think, is trying to um, uh, quantify what the recipient and potentially the donor is getting out of this process of not giving to the recipient they intended, but instead going into the uh, paired exchange. And this um, decision making is helped somewhat by a, a paper uh, that quantifies sort of the quality of a donor for a given recipient, and it's done by putting in various donor and recipient factors and coming up with a score very similar to the KDPI score that's used for deceased donors, but it's a little bit different scale. And I think what we're envisioning is if you have a, a donor-recipient pair where the living donor uh, score is uh, not particularly great, potentially they could upgrade their score by going into one of these compatible exchanges, and you can see here these scores correlate with graft loss um, after a transplant, and if you were able to drop from one bracket to another by going into a compatible uh, exchange, um, that may be a way to uh, have patients be more interested in this route. So that's something we're looking at as well. I mentioned the Living Kidney Donor Champion Program. That's, uh, I think, uh, a program that's uh, started off with, uh, with some success. It's really designed to be an educational program, not only for potential donors and recipients, but more importantly for the so-called donor champion, who may be somebody who knows the recipient and is going to be responsible for asking people around the recipient if they'd be interested in donating, thereby removing the pressure and the awkward nature of the recipient themselves having to ask potential donors. So this is done by having a, a series of educational uh, programs that are run by our coordinators and docs to, to help educate these people uh, that are around the uh, recipient, and hopefully that'll translate into more transplants. 
Um, one other uh, advance I think that we've seen over the last year since uh, I spoke with you uh, at last year's meeting was our donor pain management uh, protocol. We've now gone to a, a management strategy that uses an anesthetic block at the completion of the donor operation in an effort to help minimize the use of narcotics. And of course, with the opioid uh, epidemic and concerns about strong painkillers, this was a timely change, and I think it's really worked out well for our donors. I can tell you as a donor surgeon seeing them on post-operative day one when they haven't been using a PCA all night with morphine, they look a whole lot better, and I think when they get out of the hospital, they feel a lot better as well, so that's been a nice improvement. I also wanted to mention a little bit about another aspect of our program that I, I think um, uh, you get flavors of when you hear the different speakers throughout the day, but it's really our, our research efforts, and I don't want to go through every docs and uh, list of research efforts, but just highlight a couple that uh, Flavio's, of course, working on uh, new drugs all the time. I'm sure he's going to mention a few words in his talk. Uh, Minnie Sarwal has uh, just been awarded a grant to look at uh, uh, immune responses to CMV and kidney transplant. And along with Peter Stock is uh, in charge of our training grant for uh, uh, surgeons uh, in the lab. Uh, Dr. Kung is looking at some methods to better uh, monitor post-transplant outcomes. And on the surgical side, I just wanted to highlight uh, both Dr. Stock and Dr. Fang, who uh, made the top 20 uh, funded, highest funded uh, surgeons in the country, uh, which I think is an absolutely remarkable accomplishment considering how busy they are clinically. And, uh, and I think it just shows the, the backbone of our program it is quite strong in many different aspects. Dr. Garrett Roll, our newest addition, uh, is in charge of our Cohen project, which is a sort of multi-pronged approach to try and better use some of these marginal kidneys, uh, better use HCV positive donor kidneys by getting more of our recipients ready, uh, coming up with some strategies to use more of the high KDPI kidneys and basically looking at some of our workflows so we can uh, make these transplants happen more commonly. So, I think this will be another strategy to get us uh, to that 400 transplant mark. In terms of future prospects, we're very excited about our clinic expansion, which should happen in fall of 2019. If you've ever been to our offices, we have about half of the floor of the clinic building. We're going to take over the whole floor and uh, triple our exam room space, so it'll give us some more capacity to take care of, of your patients. Uh, we're always looking at ways to expand our outreach, potentially even uh, bringing more post-transplant cares into the community. And then hopefully one of these days we'll get our software uh, better integrated with the EPIC uh, software that we have with a special transplant module. Dr. Aidy wanted me to mention uh, a strategy that uh, the nephrology group is going to be putting in place. And if you have any uh, comments about this, I'm sure she'd be happy to chat with you afterwards. But basically, um, there uh, is a, a plan to change a little bit how we follow labs in patients, the long-term stable patients, once they're greater than five years post-transplant. Uh, we'd like to uh, have um, uh, the local uh, nephrologists ordering the labs and keeping an eye on the labs. Obviously, we're available for consultation if there's any changes uh, or concerns. Um, but we think, given that many of these labs slip through our system and we never see them anyways, we want to make sure we assign uh, someone who can pay closer attention to the labs and make sure we catch problems when they're happening. Um, we'll obviously still want to see the patients on an annual basis and uh, kind of look back at what's going on with the labs, but the uh, quarterly ordering we're going to shift to the local nephrologists. And again, telehealth, I think, still has an unrealized uh, potential and whether we can integrate that more into our practice to help with uh, taking care of patients who aren't close to our center is, is always something we're looking at. So I wanted to close with a, a little bit of a new segment, if you will. I told you about our current program, some plans for the future, but we come from such a rich program in terms of history, I thought it'd be kind of fun to 
take a little visit to the past. And uh, of course, um, I hope everyone knows that our program has been here since 1962. The first transplant was done in 1964 by Dr. John Najarian, who was my chair of surgery when I went through residency at Minnesota, and Dr. Folker Belzer. In 1967, Dr. Najarian left UCSF and became the chair at the University of Minnesota. And at that point, uh, Dr. Sam Kuntz was recruited um, to become the new chief of transplant. So Dr. Uh, Kuntz is shown here. Um, he was born in 1931 in Arkansas, actually became the first African American to be admitted to the University of Arkansas Medical School. He ended up doing his residency at Stanford and uh, absolutely fascinating, he was involved with Dr. Roy Cohn in doing uh, the first successful kidney transplant between relatives who weren't identical twins. So that would have been in 1961. He had a very active research program and, as I said, was recruited to be the chief of transplant at UCSF in 1967. And his initial uh, pioneering work was done with Dr. Belzer. Uh, on the uh, kidney perfusion machine, which would allow for deceased donor kidneys to now be implanted up to 30 hours after they had been recovered from a donor. His uh, accomplishments went far beyond that, however. He um, formed the Center for Human Values at UCSF. I don't know if anybody in this room knows what that was. I, I certainly wasn't around at that time, but it was basically sort of a committee to discuss some of the ethics of transplant, which obviously you could imagine were, were uh, quite uh, on the radar screen at that point in time. He also started the Kidney Transplant Club, which was meant for patients and nurses to kind of talk uh, uh, in, a, in a setting where they could share their stories and very much like the support groups that we have now. He actually was the one that developed the concept of pulse steroids for rejection. Um, he really was focused on a thriving research program when he was at UCSF. And in fact, back then, he made UCSF the busiest transplant uh, center in the country. This is a story that was published on him uh, when he said he did 80 kidney transplants in a year. This would have been about 1969, I believe it was. And uh, he was actually the, one of the busiest surgeons in the country. Um, I actually did uh, research in the lab on local immunosuppression, so I came across this paper, when I was working more with the liver, but he actually had the idea of placing a catheter in the iliac artery, uh, shown on the left there, it's a little hard to see, but it would drip uh, methylprednisolone into the iliac artery, which then would perfuse the kidney sort of in a local fashion and uh, avoid hopefully some of the systemic side effects. He would leave the catheters in for three weeks and he published in The Lancet uh, a series of 60 patients, you can see the graph survival there, which for the mid-1960s was pretty phenomenal. So in 1972, he was recruited uh, to New York. He became the chair of surgery there, also set up a transplant program at downstate um, uh, in New York. Um, and then remarkably, in 1976, performed a kidney transplant on the Today Show. And the following day, there were 20,000 people that inquired about organ donation. So clearly living donor kidney transplantation was an important part of his belief as to how to best take care of these patients with uh, kidney failure. And he was also very uh, instrumental in helping to establish the concept that living kidney donation is safe and the good thing for both the donors and the recipients. Here he is uh, at uh, Downstate. You can see the flow charts on the wall. And anyone who's been around more than 20 years before we had electronic ways of keeping track of labs remembers the flow sheets. Uh, it's been said that he never needed the flow sheets. He could remember all of his patients' creatinine, so pretty remarkable. Um, unfortunately, he passed away at a young age, 51, after a... a uh, a devastating neurologic uh, condition. He was infected with something when he was lecturing in, in uh, South Africa. No one's ever figured it out. But I think a great uh, pioneer, a great um, uh, person that is part of UCSF. And I think the reason I chose him for uh, a look at the past was 
he embodies a lot of the philosophies that I think our program still has today. Powerful research, think about living donation, dedication to their patients, so a real, a real role model. So with that, I'll end. I got a couple quick uh, slides, just informational uh, purposes. This is the uh, website to get your CME credits. Um, Peggy Millar will have more information on that if you need it. And as I mentioned last year, you can actually get access to these talks and prior talks uh, by going to this website. And again, you can email Peggy and she can hook you up if, uh, if you can't jot this down fast enough. And uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.